Ok, estamos grabando. Ok, so this is the last case of today. I think the reaction is a little bit tight, but no, it's good. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. We have big urethras in Spain, maybe. Ah. So this is the sphincter edge, more or less. Huh? And you can tell this was supposed to be a very large gland. Maybe it's very wide. Ah, it's not too long. Yours are close to the edge, so we have to be careful later on. The bladder. A little bit uh, trabeculated, no? But this is a uh, very standard, very common in the in the patients we operate, no? So let's put the fiber in. That's the burial again, and here you can see the edge of the sphincter, no? Here I'm going to mark here the the white line, huh? So I'm going to try to develop this, this white line. There's some mucosal bleeding, it's quite common. So sometimes you can even have trouble, let's say, finishing the, the landmark, the marking of the, of the white line. If there's, a little, if, if there's a lot of blood, like now, where you know it, it comes to a point where you don't see very well, my advice is to go in the plane, huh? to look for the plane and start a nucleating. If, uh, on the contrary, you can you can see very well, my advice is to develop, let's say, a groove, you see, following the white line. If you deepen the white line a little bit, you know, you can, you can develop a groove that establishes a separation between the adenoma and the apex, no? But let's go into the plane. So, this is uh, the Vero Montanum. So here, you see, if you, if you push a little bit with your scope, you're going to enter the, the proper plane very easily. Let me cut and coagulate here. I want to release the, the attachments of the sphincter to the adenoma from 6 o'clock to, to 9 o'clock in this side. And then on the other side, I'd like to do the same. It's following the, the white line. The typical maneuver to, to enter the the proper plane is to put the scope very close, in close proximity to the very montanum and then push a little bit sideways, eh? lateral. Uh, but you can you can do a little bit of mechanical dissection at the apex. And that will give you the clue of uh, where is the where is the where is the good plane. Of course, when you have localized the plane in both sides, it's only logical to try to connect them in the midline. So you cut on top of the Vero Montanum. At the beginning of the operation, sometimes you can have bad visibility, but this will very soon change, as, as you will see. Of course, you can try to spend a little time trying to find out where's the bleeding coming from, and uh, try to do some hemostasis, but most of the times you can just progress, and hemostasis will take place. Also, a lot of the bleeding is coming from the adenoma. And as you, let's say, detach the adenoma from the capsule, you are uh, sectioning the, the vessels that Yeah, uh, so that's the posterior plane. I'm going to put the fiber at 12 o'clock. And I'm going to follow the dissection a little bit further. Of course, if the bleeding continues, I will try to do some hemostasis before progressing. Uh, but here you can see that I'm developing the lower, the posterior uh, plane, trying to split the screen in two, trying to keep the line of attack, the line of dissection in the middle of the screen. And at the beginning of the procedure, my, let's say, aim is going to be to, la to lace against the line here, for example, 
see the capsule is getting a little bit thin. Here we will have to get, let's say, closer to the adenoma. But I think this, this is probably enough posterior dissection for the moment. Let's see where the bleeding is, is coming from. Let's see if we can stop it. It's a little bit, it's a little bit of a nuisance, no? It's a little bit apical, apical bleeding. Okay, there's a vessel there. Let's see if we can control that one. There's a number of them, huh? Okay, so it's going to be a little bit bloody. Anyway, this is 12 o'clock. This is the white line we marked. So the next, and this is the mucosa of the sphincter, you see? So the next step is going to be to cut on the prostate to try to deepen, let's say, the, the white line for three, four millimeters, five millimeters, something like that. I'm not trying to develop the plane, just I'm trying to, to cut yeah, the adherences of the uh, apex to the, to the sphincter. And then I'm going to try to look for the good plane. Huh? This looked like a bit of tissue that was... It's a little bit uncomfortable. We don't have very good visibility for the moment. It'll, it'll get better. So now let's see if we can... We can follow the, the, the nice plane. Maybe get some better hemostasis. Well, there we are. Trying to come up. That looks like a noma. Trying to go from laterally around the apex. But here, if you come out to, to see, uh, here it's clear that we have to cut again a little bit on the prostate horizontally below the sphincter to get to the let's say 12 o'clock fibers here. Huh? So this way we, we leave the sphincter behind us. Now we can try to, let's say, conquer the peak of the adenoma at 12 o'clock. So progressively coming up, coming up, coming up. But after having released the, the sphincter from the apex in the more, most distal part. You know? This is again, a little bit of tissue at the apex, coming towards 12 o'clock. You see, here is maybe in a case like this, maybe with Moses, you would have the same initial bleeding, but maybe the control of hemostasis would be a little bit better or easier, no? Just doing the same work and doing the same steps, you know? So here we're coming up, 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 up. I try to look at the direction of the fibers here, you see? Because that gives you the clue or where the plane is going. So sometimes we decide what to do based on tiny anatomical details, you know, that you have to be searching for and looking for. Of course, you develop this understanding of the anatomy with uh, some experience. There we are. So for the moment, we released a big part of the Noma coming towards 12 o'clock. This is uh, 12 o'clock fibers, maybe we can completes the, the cut here. And the visibility is not so good. Okay. The water is not uh, particularly low, so we have these apical bleeders. Okay, so this is sphincter. This is uh, the white line we marked. And again, I'm going to cut on the tissue a little bit, on the prostate. Yeah, 
here we are following a good a good uh, a good cut and then now we look for the good plane now this is a good plane so we gain a lot of access by doing that incision on the prostate now here we are you see why I find it useful to develop the posterior plane a little bit because when you're doing this dissection of the lateral aspect you get orientation in the in the lower part in the posterior but here we're coming up 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 let's see what we have here you see this is seems to be okay 12 o'clock although the visibility here is falling very fast so let's try to develop this lateral plane a little bit further this allows the tip of the adenoma to follow down you know it comes down you know my scope can go and here we are lowering the tip you see so these fibers that sometimes are a little bit parallel to the to the laser fiber become verticalized you see because i'm, I'm pushing the nose or the tip of the of the adenoma down you see all these fibers become more accessible now you can cut them just because I position my scope on this on the lateral aspect you know trying to push down the adenoma and let's see if we can cross over towards the other side let's come out and check if yeah it looks like a great uh, plane and now we have connected huh we finally release the apex completely and we are in a good plane we can continue our dissection now uh, circumferentially huh? there we are that's very good now we are connecting you see this is a normal uh, let's say view of, of the capsule some people say that anteriorly there's no good plane but I disagree I think sometimes you find beautiful plane anteriorly as well you see I'm going to try to of course you have to find a speed of dissection that provides you nice developing of the, of the plane but at the same time nice hemostasis you know if you rush it too much you can find that there are many bleeders going on the, at the same time and then it might be difficult to establish hemostasis properly you know it, it will take more time you will regret that you did the dissection very fast sometimes you get carried away with how good the plane is and how the dissection is progressing but then of course you leave too many vessels small vessels but too many at the same time you know so it's important to let's say carry a good hemostasis as you go and recheck it because many times there is some degree of uh, spasm of the vessels you know when you cut through them and initially they don't bleed but then they start bleeding a little bit so of course we don't want to go too slow you know generating uh, very very exaggerated hemostasis you no know, and uh, widening of the whole fossa you know it's not usually necessary so you have to try to find the right balance you no know, for you of speed of dissection quality of hemostasis but in, in general you see now we got excellent visibility now we have very good visibility and that's because we are irrigating a very small space you know just the space between the anoma and the capsule so that allows us to see very well and if there's any blood in the irrigation fluid we'll clear it you know just being a, bit, a little bit careful with the hemostasis usually you can progress 
reasonably fast. Also, you can see that I'm not lifting the pedal, my foot from the pedal. I, I am dissecting, let's say, continuously, continuously, all the time. Just very brief stops when I have to check something, when I have to come back to check stuff. But that makes this operation extremely fast. You see, I'm just progressing, stopping to coagulate. Not too much, not too little. Just uh, enough, let's say. And here, you see, the, the fact that we are dissecting a circumferential plane makes it very easy to, to recognize and in, in, if in some area you're not totally sure of, maybe you see this and you think, this is a good plane. Okay, let's go up a little bit. Let's go down a little bit, you see. This is going to give you some orientation. So, of course, if it becomes, let's say, if it looks deep or if, you, if it looks as if you're getting deeper and deeper, you can correct, you see, by getting closer to the adenoma. And then you leave, you see a little bit of, here is where we changed. No, we were following this plane. It looked a little bit deep. So I, I changed the direction of the fiber to correct the plane again. Of course, as, as, as we pass the equator again uh, of the dissection, the fiber has to point a little bit closer to the adenoma, not, not, not right at the line of attack as we were doing at the beginning. This is because of the pseudo spherical nature of the adenoma. No, we, we, we have to initially the, the, the plane was looking up, going up, and now the plane has to go down here. Initially it was going outside and now it has to go, let's say, inside, you know, to the midline. So instead of firing right at the line of attack, which can go I mean I can go in the castle like that, you know, you have to get progressively closer, closer, closer to the adenoma. Stay close, because if you stay close to the adenoma, what will happen is that the fibers that are attaching the adenoma to the capsule will be cut by the energy, but there will be very little energy going into the capsule. And some, some bleeders. It's a plexus, no more than anything. Let's, just, let's see if we can follow the, the right lane there and uh, get to the bottom, to the base of that Lexus, follow the plane. Ah, here you see, here we see circular fibers again, this is the bladder neck. Here we see vertical fibers, this is the entrance to the bladder. You know? Now we open some vessel, which is bleeding on our face. If you see that everything gets red, you shouldn't be afraid. You know? Most likely there is a vessel, a single vessel, bleeding on your on your face, you know what I mean? So it doesn't mean that the patient is bleeding too much or anything, just sometimes if you get some distance you can see where the bleeding is coming from and control it a little bit better. But let's open the bladder neck a little bit more. We don't want a lot of vessels uh, bleeding at the same time, but I think if we open the bladder neck, we will be able to see where are these vessels. And this is all bladder mucosa, you see? Bladder mucosa. It's bladder. Say again? The yours were close, yes, but as we are now in the interior uh, aspect, for the moment we don't worry about that, huh? but we'll have to check as we cut, let's say, the bladder neck uh, towards towards the posterior area. Huh? Here what I'm doing is trying to coagulate, you know, those vessels that were bleeding from the mucosa. Huh? So if we develop the, the bladder neck a little bit more and we cut the bladder neck, We will have to look in, inside and see where the UOs are. Huh? That's a good suggestion. It tells me that you are understanding the procedure very well. Huh? 
initially it's a little bit strange to see this apical liberation, but the more cases you see, the more uh, you understand it, and the more you are able to predict, you know, what I, I'm going to do next, huh? which means that you understand the procedure. It's very important to watch cases before you try to do it on your own, because, and of course, if you can have a mentor with you, it's, it's much, much better. We were discussing before that if you're going to start your own experience, it's very important to select the cases properly. Initially, you see that I'm dissecting the plane very, very fast. But initially, you're going to be very slow. You're going to go like that very carefully, you know, very, very slow. So if you do a very large gland, it might get very tedious and very lengthy and so my advice is to choose prostates that are bigger than 40 grams, maybe 50, 60, 70. Yeah. Also, if you're going to start on your own, which is not ideal, right? it's, it's much better always to have, let's say, a mentor that can help you, take you out of trouble and, let's say, teach you just being by your side, you know? the. The idea is, if you're starting on your own, that you can always resort to the resectoscope in case of trouble. Look at the UO, huh? It's very, very close. And of course, if you want to handle, let's say, a prostate in this state, you know, where some of the prostate has been detached from the adenoma, some of the prostate is still attached with a resectoscope, it's not an easy resection. So I wouldn't choose to do that on a very large gland. But if it's a 60 gram prostate, maybe you, you can perfectly get out of trouble, you know, finish the case and... Also, I think very often we try to, when you're doing something new, we try to oversell it to the patients, you know? Especially, especially when when they when they had to pay for it, no. Let's say if it's something that their insurance doesn't cover or something, no. So I think it's a bad idea. I think it's better, much better to tell the patient this is, uh, let's say, probably safer. But you know, in some instances, we might need to convert to TRP. My goal is going to be that uh, you are you know, going to be relieved of your symptoms. If there's any trouble, I will stop. And, and that's a very clear uh, recommendation as well. Eh? If, if you have any trouble that you cannot deal with, it's always better to stop. Huh? Patients are never unhappy with you. Tell them, I stopped because it was not safe to continue. Huh? So this happened to me a couple of times during my learning curve. And I told the patient I stopped, I couldn't finish the procedure. It was not safe and I thought, what would I do with, uh, you know, a family member, huh? You want safety first, so it's always safer to come back another day with things that have settled. Many times if you leave a prostate, let's say like this, imagine that you cannot finish or there's a perforation or something and you decide to stop. Coming back and Orienting yourself after some days, it's much easier. If there was a perforation, it has already closed. And then you can e easily finish uh, the procedure. So at the beginning of your experience, maybe you can tell the patient, there's a small chance that we will need to do two stage, you know? But I think that despite, let's say, common understanding, no, uh, OLEP is not so difficult to learn. I think TORP is a much more difficult operation. And we have all learned TORP, no? Despite, well, I, I haven't done one for many, many years, so. I haven't done a TORP for, I don't know since 2003, I think, so 17 years. 
Of course, I'm doing a much better job now than I was doing at the beginning uh, when I was using laser, the green eye laser for vaporization, but there we are, huh? So that's the posterior plane. That's the, the bladder neck, you see? So we need to continue. We need to be very careful here. Trying to continue close to the adenoma. See, close to the anterior aspect, close to the adenoma. Like that. You see, if you went this way, it would be a problem. But it, as long as you stay, you know, close to the adenoma, you see that we are respecting that layer of capsule there, which might be a little bit thin. Yeah. See, when you come to this side, you see that to keep close, keep close, keep close. You know, it doesn't matter if you leave a little bit of tissue there because that's actually the capsule what you're leaving, huh? you know? Remember to try to do, let's say, relatively wide movements. Huh? Because if you go a little bit fast, you know, the, the fastness, the speed of, of dissection, you know, provides a very nice detachment of the adenoma, but also very safe. You see that you can find a working distance that produces this effect of opening the plane and giving you some hemostasis of the remaining tissue. You have to be thinking constantly. You know, many people are a little bit like robots. When it happened with the green light laser, when they were rotating the fiber, they made a very, let's say, standard rotation movement. Very, they didn't adapt the rotation speed or the distance of the fiber to the tissue to the moment in the operation. You know? And here, you have to be constantly playing with the fiber distance and the, the let's say, angle of incidence where where do you where do you fire if you fire against the line of attack or closer to the adenoma you know you have to, to play with this tissue effects uh, targeting practice to get exactly what you want you have to change your strategy during the operation no so it doesn't it's a very concentrated let's say activity where you have to be absolutely focused on, on what you're doing. Again, eh? stay close to the adenoma. Now I feel the, let's say, the weight of the adenoma on my scope, which means that I need to push a little bit upwards if I want to go in that plane. So what I'm going to check now is where is the UO in relation to where we are now? Let's see where it is. It was close here. So why? Because I want to cut here in the bladder neck towards the midline a little bit so I can, uh, let's say, rotate the adenoma and push it into the bladder, even when there is some remaining attachment at 6 o'clock. So here I'm liberating a little bit the lateral aspect. See with very careful movements, but as I get here near the, the UO, you see, we have to be careful. I will cut more into this edge. Sometimes we are very, very close to the yours. But this way also, what I'm doing is I'm making the hinge, the pivot of the rotation of the adenoma very, very narrow. If you need to rotate the adenoma with this uh, bladder neck still attached here, it's going to be very difficult. But if you 
make it narrow, then it's going to be much easier. You know, that's the UO there. You see, it's it's very, very, very close. Huh? So I'm going to be very careful here, just as we did on the other side. Just try to let's say release a little bit laterally here. Let's say from lateral to medial. Again, that's it. Huh? Now we can cut here. I think here it's safe. And again, we are making the, the hinge very thin in the midline. So now I'm going to try to do hemostasis because you see, while we maintain uh, a nice uh, laminar flow in this space, you know, because we can see the capsule, we can have good visibility and we can carry on our hemostasis. If you push the anonoma in the ladder, then the, the, the flow inside the fossa is very chaotic, which means that there will be blood everywhere. You cannot flush it so easily. So it's nice before turning the, the tipping, how do you say it, uh, tipping the, the anonoma into the bladder, flipping it, you can do your hemostasis here. You see it's quite capsular. We found a bleeding bumper here somewhere. Maybe I ran out of water, that's the reason as well for the lower visibility. Ah, here it is. Huh? So it's very nice to to do the hemostasis while the anoma is still in the fossa. Because you see we get much better visibility. And even when we get good hemostasis inside the fossa, when we push the anoma into the bladder, you'll see that the visibility drops a little bit. You know, it never looks the same. I think some planes are more inflammatory. Some planes are a little bit less inflammatory. Sometimes we see a beautiful, uh, let's say, interface between the anoma and the capsule. Here I wouldn't go inside because below, I mean behind this, this there's the UO. Huh? So just going to do some hemostasis of this area, get the vessels. Okay, it's somewhat better. Let's see the posterior aspect. Sometimes we don't pay too much attention to this posterior aspect, but sometimes there are some bleeders here as well. You see, I'm playing with the distance because this is the same setting, the 250. I'm playing with the distance to get a coagulative effect that is not aggressive, no? Sometimes when you have a very flimsy, very thin capsule, by trying to coagulate, if you get too close, you can cut open no the, the plane or the, the capsule so you have to you have to get very very good sensitivity and develop this sensitivity so you can tailor the the laser effect on the tissue depending on the clinical scenario but this is uh, let's say more bloody than usual this patient i don't know why no, we've done other cases and we, we didn't see 
this kind of uh, hypervascularity. This is starting to look better and better. This uh, the, pe the penetration of this energy is very shallow. It's not it's not dangerous to to use this energy in the prostate. It penetrates very 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 not very deep. These are the bleeders you want to get. The ones that are pouring blood into the operative fields. Okay see what happens if we lift see I'm going to put my scope under the lobe try to lift it a little bit what's happening so Mechanically, you can do some harm as well, so you have to be careful. I wanted to lift the abnormal to see if I could push it into the ladder, but now I have a better view of, uh, of the attachment at 6 o'clock. Let's lift the other side as well. See, no, now we, what I achieved is to, to, to push the abnormal in the bladder. All right, look how the visibility falls huh? in, inside the fossa. You see, much worse. Look at the adenoma, it was going retro-trigonal. Here's the bladder neck. They all must be near here somewhere. There it is, huh? It's safe, but close, huh? And this is the attachment here, last attachment, you see. Sometimes it's difficult to get there from, from below. So if you tilt the anoma in the ladder, it becomes much easier to, to target it, to cut it. This, one of the things that uh, is not so nice from the holmium is that this explosive uh, nature of the holmium, when you get to the mucosa, sometimes it generates a little bit of bleeding. So these mucosal vessels tend to tend to bleed a little bit. Let's see you all again. Ah, it's safe but uh, close as, as well. So you have to insist a little bit to do hemostasis. But we finished, huh? Probably took longer than usual this, this operation. It was a little bit bigger the prostate, but more because of the bleeding uh, tendency. I don't know why. You see, there's some bleeding still. No? Let's see if there's any big vessel that is contributing to this. You see, some, some of these vessels sometimes, when you coagulate them, the visibility improves significantly. It's true that we didn't concentrate on the anterior prostate at the end, not before, let's say, tilting the abnoma. Well, you have to you have to try to get good hemostasis before morphation, and if you can't, then you go in with a rolly ball. Look at the this is a post abnormal growing retrotrigonally. You see, so without entering the capsule, just by keeping close to the abnormal. Huh? If you don't get good visibility to to morphate, then what you have to do is you you have to go in with a rolly ball and try to make it perfect eh? or make it better. 
some oozing still. Okay, I think it's probably good enough. Let's see if we find any, any major. Oh, here it is. It's quite far, huh? In, in this, it looks much much closer and very frightening. But no, but you have to be careful, of course. Huh? We can travel it here a little bit more, and let's morsel it. I'm going to uh, take out the fiber. Let's see if we can do a fast uh, change of instruments without decompressing the bladder too much. Gracias. Okay. Um, now the urine coming out of the it's quite clear it's not very bloody so i think we can pro progress to morselation okay venga water in please that's a clot see there's a clot abre abre venga abre todas las dos cuando puedas it's just a clot and huh? we are under the clot so you can you can suck suck the clot huh? That's tissue. So let's start the morselation again. Uh, I like to be, to go below the adenoma. You know, typically the the water that comes out during the change of instruments, you fill it up again while getting ready to morselate. You know what I mean? So I close the outflow. I leave the inflow open, and I try to keep the bladder more or less distended. Here, I'm keeping the blade inside the bladder so I can see the adenoma on top and I can see the two corners around the, the blades and tell me that uh, I am in the center of the bladder, more or less. This morselation with the perineo system is amazing because it's pretty fast. And also, if you think about it, you know, I'm just still in the middle of the bladder and the tissue is coming to the blade, so I don't need to move, I don't need to fish very often. So when morselation is efficient like this, it's, it's wonderful. I don't use the second inflow, uh, like most people do, but I am very, very careful of uh, the balance between in, uh, water going in and water go coming out. If you cannot see the mouth of the morselator, now we cannot see it. I mean, this is the mouth. We only see tissue in contact with it. There will be very little amount of water coming out and a lot of tissue. If we can see the mouth a lot, it means that you're sucking out a lot of water. And then you have to be careful because the bladder could empty. And then the bladder wall comes closer to the morselation blades. I have had accidents in the past, but they were luckily not uh, terrible accidents and uh, they could be uh, sorted conservatively but of course experience helps with morselation in the sense that you are more confident you can work let's say with a little bit worse visibility but of course you, sh you shouldn't be overconfident eh? because I think there is a there's a window of opportunity for morselation. You know, when you do your hemostasis and you have, let's say, good visibility. Um, you start your morselation and what you want to do is to want to finish as soon as possible because distending the bladder for more than 20 minutes is going to cause bleeding. Bleeding from the fossa that gets distended again. Bleeding from the bladder from the mucosal edges you know and also because we are not let's say we don't have a continuous flow system we have 
entrance of, of uh, water and there's some outflow, but it's, it's not an efficient washout. So more and more, the, the visibility is going to degrade. And if you cannot take the tissue out in 20 minutes, it's very likely that you're going to need to stop, change the instrument, go in with a laser or the rolly ball to coagulate further, you know, and then start again with morphilation. And then it becomes less, less beautiful, less, less efficient and sometimes a uh, pain you not know, finishing these operations when when there's bad visibility and also dangerous eh? so that's why I, I recommend everybody to invest in a very good morselator there are a number of them now in the market which give you very good morselation rates and uh, at the moment the perennial system is my my favorite uh, the stores uh, morselator has improved it was very slow at the beginning, but I tried it recently and I have to say, in my opinion, it's probably a little bit slower than the Perenia, but it's still fast. And I have heard about this uh, Chinese morselator, the Hawk morselator. People who use it say that uh, it's very fast. So larger prostates take a little bit longer to morselate. But there's nothing we do differently in patients with larger prostates as compared to the smaller ones. Uh, we leave a catheter the same way overnight. We take it out the next morning the same way. We have a protocol to remove the catheter. That's to wash the bladder before removing the catheter. Then uh, deflate the balloon and uh, withdraw the catheter a little bit so the tip of the catheter goes to the prostatic fossa. And then... Uh, wash the fossa to take clots out. Sometimes when you have retention postoperatively, it's because there are clots in the fossa. And then we give, uh, we put 250, 300 mils in the bladder, as much as the patient, let's say, tolerates. And uh, after that, we remove the catheter. So the first void is immediate, most of the times, and the patient gets confident that he can pee and then we give him some furosemide for, for 20, uh, 20 milligrams of furosemide IV. And they, we, we instruct them to drink plenty. So in two or three hours, they, they pee three times or four times, sometimes one liter. And we ask them to pee on a jar so we can see the color and the quantity. And if they pass a reasonable color, usually it's a red wine at the beginning. Then it becomes more like a rosé wine then they can go home. Huh? I, I tell this to my patients so they anticipate what's going to happen in the postoperative period because otherwise they can get very scared when they see the color of the urine uh, when they pee. Many times the washout is totally clear, even a drop by drop washout, but when, you, when we take the catheter out, they have hematuria. And in two occasions I had to staple a head wound in a patient who got, uh, you know, fainted after seeing the red urine coming out. Ah. So, yeah. No, it's a, quite, a, re a relatively large gland. Huh? It's taking quite a while to morselate, so I guess we're going to get a lot of tissue out. But the morselation is very efficient and very happy. Also, uh, for us, it was very important to find these five liter containers for the morselation device, because instead of having to change the, the container uh, one or two times uh, during morselation, we managed to, to morselate most of the times in one go without. So typically the, the device comes with a three liter container, but uh, Medela, the company is producing uh, five liter, which works equally well. Yeah, the vacuum takes a little bit longer to, to establish, of course, but uh, it's, it's very, very, very nice to be able to morselate large amounts of tissue without stopping as, as we had to do before. It's important to, as a, as a surgeon, to, to know how to use the morselator and all its subtleties, you know, because uh, so if you're going to buy a morselator, make sure that the company tells you everything about the device 
what could go wrong, what could happen, because when, when you are in this moment in the operation where the bladder is extended, the visibility is falling slowly, you know, you don't want to spend a lot of time trying to pinpoint what's going on with the morselator, why doesn't morselation work, you know? So, Maybe the, the bucket of tissue is quite full now, and that can sometimes compromise the sucking, let's say, force, uh, the negative pressure. So the suction is a little bit milder, you see, and sometimes you lose the... the so every time you change the, the faucet, you know, it's important to also change the tissue basket because the tissue tends to condensate because of the suction, the suction has to go through the tissue basket, you know? The, the negative pressure is transmitted through the tissue basket, so the... Uh, wait, wait, wait a minute, I think. I'm going to try to bring it into the fossa, let's see. Now we are in the fossa, but uh, still not good. Now you see visibility is dropping a little bit. Yeah, so... There's still one piece, let's see if I can find it. It went into the fossa, this is a small plot forming. Ah, here I catched it again. But I'm going to go in with our sectoscope to check. Vamos a usar el sector. Un poquito de glicina. So, come here. I'm going to check with our sectoscope to do the final check. Sometimes it's necessary. You know, for example, with the Moses, we don't need to usually. There's a, only a mild, uh, mild uh, hematuria coming out. So I think the moment we put the catheter is going to be okay. But I want to check. I want to check that there's no. Déjame el receptor, por favor. Pon una, pon una. Gracias. Sí, enchúfala. So there we are. Let's have a look. This is a monopolar resectoscope. We don't have a bipolar because we, we don't do TORP. That's an empty bladder. You see there's some oozing. You all? Huh? You all again? It's the fossa. Let's see if there's any piece inside. It doesn't look as if there is any piece. And then look at the sphincter. You see, we managed to preserve the mucosa on the sphincter. There's a little bit of damage, I think, going in, probably, because of this uh, cops collar. You see, there's a small clot forming. But there doesn't seem to be any, uh, let's say, residual. Oh yeah, there is. Uh, so there's a small piece. I'm going to try to. It's not. Uh, it's not well connected. So it's a piece. I think it's the one that we tried to lure into the fossa before, but of course the visibility in the fossa was not so good. So we lost it. Where is it? Vamos, está. Some uh, problem with the electrica. No, I think we can pull it out. Let's try. Let's see if I can cut on the on the piece. Funciona o no? Ahora. Está bien conectado. Tienes que conectarlo arriba, eh. A ver, ¿ahí se conecta o arriba? Ok. Venga. Ok. So. Now this is cutting. As it's monopolar, it will only cut when it's in contact with the capsule. You know what I mean? The, the current has to go through the adenoma and then into the capsule of the prostate and then out through the electrode in the skin. No? So now I'm bringing the piece out through the meatus. That's it. 
when we have finished. I'm going to make a last uh, look. Last look. Again, a good sphincter, good cavity. I don't see any major bleeding. It's like more oozing, no? And look, if you look at this, uh, let's say, capsule that looked very frightening at the end, at the, well, while we were doing the laser, you can see that there's a tissue layer there, you see? You know Vale, sí. We're finishing in a moment. You see, it looks very frightening with the laser, but when you go in with the resectoscope, it's not so frightening. It looks... You can see? Huh? I think the balloon will stop this. Uh, say again? Yeah, nothing major, yeah. No, it's, it's coming out basically very clear, I think. Also, you know that... I don't see any bleeder, huh? active bleeder, so it's more like oozing from the... When, when, we, when we stop the distension, all of this is going to contract, I think, and the oozing will stop. Huh? But there's no dishonor in uh, going in and check, ah, for example, this vessel could be a problem, huh? You know what I mean? It's it's uh, it's patient safety what you want. So you want to go in and finish uh, the procedure by checking the hemostasis. You can do. Huh? Yeah, but you know the adenoma grows on the on the trigon and be, be behind the trigon. And, uh, you know, this patient, uh, what time is it now? It's 7, 8 p.m. Tomorrow morning at uh, 8.30, something like that, the catheter will come out and he will go home. And I don't think you can do a TURP that is so anatomic. Yeah. All right, we finished. So it's been a pleasure to, to having you here. This is your home, huh? you can come anytime. Let me, let me, 